Thank you for uh, inviting me to, uh, to, uh, to this conference. Um, and it's great to see so many, uh, so many old friends. Um, today I want to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, something that I'm very excited about, something that we've done in the past year and a half to two years. Um, and I'll show you why, why it's taken us such a long time. But basically none of this would have been able without any of a wide range of um, talents and, and, and people who are here. And I'll go through um, 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 uh, you know, basically everyone's contribution to the project and to, uh, to, um, to, to what we've done. Uh, but nothing would have been possible without any, um, any of the people um, uh, here. So <coughs> just a short introduction, which is not really needed in this audience, but a short introduction is um, about the role of topology in physics and mostly about what I'm, go I'm going to talk about um, here. So I'm going to talk about perfect lattices, simple um, perfect lattices, crystals in two and three dimensions, um, which um, have block Hamiltonians um, once uh, Fourier transformed to the Brillouin zone. And this is really where topology comes into play because the Hamiltonian um, satisfies the block condition. And the block condition just tells you that the momentum is a torus. Now, this was realized since 1929, since block, but what block didn't realize and what has been realized in the, you know, starting with Thaulis and then, then extended um, um, with K and Melly and topological insulators is the fact that that um, the wave functions uh, themselves are actual um, um, maps. So basically, what um, if I write down the Schrodinger equation, such as the Hamilton is equal to energy times the wave function, and if I look at the wave function of an insulator with, say, S and P orbitals, this wave function really describes a two-sphere or a complex projective plane, CP1, and you can clearly see this because I have a gauge freedom here. I can add, I can multiply every uh, left and the right side by a phase factor. I can make this psi1 real then by just choosing it real by multiplying by a phase factor here. And then I have a normalization condition um, on the wave function, which really describes an S2. So that means that the wave functions, since I have a block Hamiltonian, are actual maps between the torus in d dimensions of a crystal and this S2 sphere. So let's take two dimensions, for example and see what these maps do. Well, these maps are obviously characterized by integers, and these integers are the covering of the, uh, sp the sphere by this map as I change the momentum on the torus. So, for example, one of these maps, which is just a trivial insulator, which means I have the largest probability on the s orbital, psi 1 is equal to 1, is the map where this, does, where this wave function doesn't do anything as I change the momentum in the torus. The other map, where this wave function does something is um, a um, winding number one. And as I change the momentum through the whole Brillouin zone, this map covers the whole um, of the sphere. Now, the properties the, of these two integers are very fundamental because integers are not adiabatically connected. I cannot get from here to here by adding infinitesimal um, numbers. And that means, in physical terms, that to get from here to here, I need to close the ball gap or do something um, um, critical to the system. Now, um, it also means that since these wave functions are maps, which is the fundamental thing that was you know, missed by the early theory of, of, of uh, block waves, etc., um, they classify wave functions and physical properties of the materials. And of course, as we know, through the you know, past 30 years and with much greater um, extent the past 10 or 12 years, this led to a huge array of things in, in condensed matter, including you know, um, quantum spin hole, topological insulators, vile semi-metals, uh, Dirac semi-metals, Majorana fermions, and a lot more complicated, say, um, insulators with weird surfaces, such as this one, which is also, you can see that this, this is not really a Dirac Fermi surface uh, on the surface of the, of the, of the, of the material. It's got this weird uh, structure. And this is, for example, stabilized by non-symorphic symmetry. So there's a wide range of, of, of insulators and topological insulators stabilized by different symmetries, which basically correspond to putting symmetries on the maps. So you know, you'd call it orbifolding. But, but basically, what it means is I'm just adding more symmetries on those wave functions maps and seeing how can I define, how can I refine my, my classes of maps that I can, that I can have. 
Now, <clears throat> this is so far a piecewise classification because you know, there's questions of how do we know when the classification is complete. For example, if I have a bulk band, um, um, which looks like this, uh, when I go on the edge, all bulk bands are not created equal. I can have um, um, edge states, as I said, and how, how many edge states can I have? And how can we find topological materials, which I think it's, is, is, is um, you know, the, more, the more practical question. So for example, how do I find, how do I go through the periodic table of elements and say that some insulators are in um, um, you know, trivial class, some are in the Z4 class, some are in Z2, some other integers, etc. So basically, you know, there's, even though this is quite a successful field, I would say, in terms of finding materials, there's still a set of measure zero of materials that you can find that you look um, um, into predictions and um, uh, experimental discoveries compared to the set of all materials in the database. So <coughs> I want to claim that kind of the reason why, why, why uh, we have this is the fact that um, 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 band structures are in momentum space and chemistry or um, orbitals or um, finding topological materials is really a real space problem because you got orbitals in in real space, and the fact that these descriptions are disjoint, one is in K space, one is in real space, is um, a deficiency which has to be remedied. And what we propose is how to remedy this deficiency and how to sort of um, um, run through all the symmetry groups, all the weak oppositions, all the orbitals, and find um, topological, um, the, the ones that can be topologically non-trivial that necessarily need to be topologically non-trivial. So let me define what I mean by topologically non-trivial first, <coughs> or int topologically interesting. So this is for insulators, this is for semi-metals. So what I define as topologically interesting for insulators is something that when I open the band gap, I have edge states in. That's not entirely true. What I'll present here is also not, there's some cases where you don't have edge states and it's still interesting, but then you'd have edge states in some sort of a, of a physical Quanti uh, physical quantity, perhaps not measurable, but gauge invariant, such as entanglement spectrum or entanglement, um, um, some other entanglement um, um, quantities. Uh, but for the purpose of, of, of the talk, let's just think of interesting as having edge states in, or surface states in the gap of, in, the, in a bulk gap. Now for semi-metals, what I define interesting is the graphene without spin orbit coupling scenario where, <coughs> where you have, you know, at filling something like at filling one half, this is an old picture, at filling one half, I have kind of a degeneracy point that's, um, um, that's, that, that, that crosses the Fermi level. Now I could kind of move this band up and this band down to cross the Fermi level to compensate the Fermi surfaces. But if I can't, if this point is, is this generated by symmetry and, you know, I break, if I don't break the symmetry, it remains, remains degenerate then, then um, at filling one half, uh, this is a protected semi-metal, and this is what I define as interesting in semi-metallic uh, systems. Now, now, what we do is, the way we kind of partition our theories is, is um, 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 th uh, three, basically twofold. First of all, we <coughs> kind of do a, a, a mapping between uh, band theory and graph theory in a way that reinterprets k.p models um, to, to, to capture the full um, topology of, of the band structures in the Brion zone. So this would kind of give you all the types of bands, all the types of possible bands that you can have in, in, in uh, solid state for non-magnetic groups with or without time reversal, with or without spin orbit coupling. Now, <coughs> these would contain both the trivial, topologically trivial, and the topologically non-trivial bands. So how do we find the topologically non-trivial one? Well, the easiest way to find them is to first find the topologically trivial ones and then take the um, um, quotient of all the bands minus the topologically trivial ones. So I'm going to tell you how to find the topologically trivial bands and then tell you how to, um, how to um, um, uh, take the quotient to find all topologically uh, non-trivial ones and then, fundamentally, because you know, the time in topological insulators has passed when you just give indices to, 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 um, to uh, uh, people, you have to tell them how to find topological materials with this. So I'll tell you how topological materials can be found with, 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 these, 
with, uh, with using these concepts. So the first concept I'm going Can everybody hear me? I'd like this, this is, no? Hello. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is, a, yeah, okay. If I use the microphone, like I can't, there's no hand to do this. <laughs> Let's see. I'm just going to speak a little bit louder, yes? <laughs> so so the, um, the fundamental thing that lattices have or crystals have is, of course, symmetries. And these symmetries are, um, are crystalline symmetries. And somehow this got a little bit messed up. But basically, um, um, symmetries come in many, many facets, not only time reversal. For example, some of the symmetries, most of the groups in nature have what's called non-somorphic symmetries, which is basically the way you walk. The way you walk is really a lattice, um, and, and um, it's got a mirror plane here. But this mirror is a glide plane in the sense that if, you t if I take mirror, this goes to here, and I have to translate by half a unit cell you know, so to, get to, to get to the same lattice. And this is a glide mirror, and you can kind of see that this will introduce interesting things in the system, because if I square this glide mirror, I get a full translation, but the full translation can be um, represented in the Brion zone by a phase factor which can be different from one at different momentum spaces. Okay, so <coughs> what k dot p theory did is to use these type of symmetries on the lattice to expand Hamiltonians around high symmetry points. So basically, k dot theory is, has been very, very successful at getting us Fermi surfaces around um, uh, um, high symmetry points um, and has been used extensively since its, um, since its inception. But what I want to point out is that k theory is nothing but, uh, k, k, k dot p theory is nothing but group theory. And what k dot p theory does is the following. If I have a high symmetry group, if I have a high symmetry point k0 with some high symmetry group, then the symmetry um, um, representation matrix commutes with the Hamiltonian. And by Schur's lemma, that means that the Hamiltonian decomposes into all the um, um, uh, uh, irreducible representations at, of that symmetry group at that, um, at that point k0. So now, you know, k dot p and, and doing, doing, you know, real materials actually gives you the values of these energies. But if I didn't want the values of these energies, which I won't want because I can't, I'm, I'm not going to obtain a uh, quantitative theory, but a qualitative theory, then you can just label them by, you know, some sort of representation label. And you can kind of put them on, on the axis, energy axis at k0. Now, again, what k dot p, k, uh, moreover, what k dot p theory does is to also give you how these representations move away from high symmetry points. So, you know, when you see bands that do this, all they do is actually they look at the, k, uh, they look at the high symmetry points, they decompose the Hamiltonian onto representations of the high symmetry points, then they look on some lines away from the high symmetry point, they decompose the Hamiltonian on symmetries of these lines away from high symmetry points, and moreover, it's pretty clear that you know, high symmetry lines would have less symmetry than high symmetry points, so then the representations at the high symmetry point will subduce, which means will decompose into symmetries of, into representations of, of the symmetries of the symmetry group away from the high symmetry point, okay? So this is what k dot p theory does. Now the fundamental thing that I want to point out that is at the heart of, well, one of the hearts of our construction is that you can do this k dot p theory around many points in the Brion zone. So I can do this k dot p theory around, say, I'm going to give you the example of graphene because it's well known. I can do this k dot p theory at the gamma point, but I can do it around the k point. And then what I can choose to do is to look at the line that connects gamma and k. Now this line, no matter whether you're here in momentum space or here in momentum space or very close to here, has the same symmetry group. It's the symmetry group of, of, of this line. So basically the representations on this line stay the same the moment you move a little bit away, the irreducible representations a little bit away from gamma and a very a little bit away from, uh, from k. So now I can do k dot p theory around gamma, k dot p theory around k, and I'll get something that looks like this, but if I look on this line, then I have a fundamental constraint, and the fundamental constraint is that 
this line has representations which come out of gamma, has representations which come out of k, and in order for these representations, which are really bands, to connect, the only way they can connect is um, uh, so that they match representation. So if this is representation one on the, of this line and this is representation two of this line, then one will not be able to connect with two. But if this is representation one of this line, this is representation two of this line, or ir ir when I say representations, I mean, I mean irreducible representations, then they can connect. And this gives you a very powerful thing because you've got many high symmetry points in the Brillouin zone and you can do this, you can kind of pick cycles on the Brillouin zone. There's a problem on how to pick the minimal number of cycles because this game gets uh, ugly very quickly. But we solved this problem and it just gives you a way to look at how bands can be connected in the Brillouin zone just from symmetry um, 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 reasons. So <coughs> you can of course then ask how are these bands connected and what is the smallest number of bands that can be fully connected in the Brillouin zone? And, or what are the, or not even the smallest, but what are the possibilities of connection in the Brillouin zone? And that's a very simple problem to do in terms of graph theory. If you map the high symmetry points to a, um, um, to nodes in a graph, and then if you say that there's an edge between high symmetry points, if the representation coming out of this line can connect to the representation coming out of the line. So for example, if I had representation one, two, and three here, and, and I would put nodes gamma and k, then there would be no way to connect between gamma, between this gamma and k representation, because this would be one, this would be two, this would be three. So I would have all zero. So basically what you can do, you can build what's called an uh, a, a agency, adjacency matrix in graph theory, where you put a one, or depending on the degeneracy of the band that comes out two, etc. You put a <coughs> uh, one if there's a connection between gamma and k and a zero if there's not. And then what you do is you form the Laplacian matrix of this, which is just, a, you know, it's just basically a very simple transformation, a linear transformation on this matrix, um, and you diagonalize it. And that gives you, the zero eigenvalues of that gives you all the types of connectivities in, in the Brillouin zone. So for example, in graphene, if I do this, so this is graphene with strong spin orbit coupling. It doesn't look like this, you know, this, this is not the Dirac point really. I mean, it's, you know, Dirac point, it's the, the Dirac point in graphene is just the concept of zero spin orbit coupling. Um, um, and you have, you know, this, this Dirac points with double degeneracy because of the spin. But if I took graphene and added strong spin orbit coupling, I would find two graphs. I would, I would do the the previous um, 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 construction, and I would find two graphs. Graph number one is all connected. So I have four bands, so two just PZ orbitals in this case, two bands because two lattice, um, 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 you know, A and B sub lattices and two spins, so four bands. And one of the graph is fully connected, which means that if I'm at half filling, which graphene is, this would be a protected semi-metal. And the other graph is an insulator. Okay, it's not fully connected if at half filling, I can sit here. Now, of course, this order of the bands doesn't matter. I can put this below this in, in, in this theory because I don't have quantitative, um, but, uh, I, but only qualitative um, uh, graphs. So, uh, but the moral of the story is that this would be an insulator if I put it here. Now, the power of what I'm going to tell you is that this has to be topological. There's no other way around it. So graphene only has two phases with PZ orbitals. Um, the phase where it's, where it's a semi-metal, and this is when Rajba spin orbit coupling is large, and the phase when it's a topological insulator, and this is where the other type of Kane and Melli spin, spin orbit coupling or Haldane spin orbit coupling is, is, is large. Now, while this could have been worked out in graphene just by hand without this graph theory, <coughs> if you have 230 space groups and a lot of positions in every lattice to put the atoms on. So what what, what, um, what you want to ask is, are there other lattices where you only have several possibilities, one of them being this band's fully connected, so that it's a semi-metal, and one of them, whenever they're disconnected, whenever you have a gap, have to be topological. And the answer is yes, for example, graphene, without having, S, uh, without having PZ orbitals, if I just go into the SMP hybridized bands, if I somehow could tune my Fermi level there, those bands would also have to be topological. So basically on the graphene lattice with the atoms sitting here, all the bands have to be topological, all types of orbitals, not only the PZ orbitals. Bismuth square nets, or are another example, 
where if I choose my um, uh, bismuth to sit at some position in the unit cell, um, and I'll tell, tell you about it, the bands have to be topological. So there's many lattices where the bands where there's only two options, well, or several options, but one is fully connected, so a semi-metal, and all the, all the disconnected options, all the <coughs> insulator options are, are topological. So, we, we, the way we know this, we, we just run through all of it. But when, you, when, you, when you see there is a gap, how do you know it has to be Ah, ah th this, is, I'll, this I'll, tell, is I'll tell you, yes. Yes, this, yes. this is coming up. This is the second part. Thank you. Yeah, that's very important. So, so and, but, th but, but this is what we want. Some, somehow, when I see a gap, if I know where the orbitals, where the atoms sit, um, uh, and I know what orbitals I have, I want to be able to tell that, uh, that if I see a gap, it's got to be topological. So this is, this is exactly, as you, you know, pointed out, at the core of things. So far, I wouldn't be able to tell you, because so far, all I've done is, is momentum space. So all I've done is just you know, symmetry, momentum space. Um, um, and in fact, some of the alternative classifications that exist in the literature miss some, thi some, some, uh, some miss this example if you don't have inversion symmetry, for example. So if you don't have inversion symmetry, some of the classifications exist in the literature would characterize this as trivial, which is not true, because graphing without inversion symmetry is still topological. Okay, <coughs> so what we've done is we've, so this, this concept of how bands connect in the Brian zone is, is um, um, was first introduced by Zach for single groups without time reversal, and there's actual, uh, I mean, it's a fundamentally, uh, you know, far-reaching and kind of like um, um, amazing concept. Uh, but their classification contains several mistakes that you know you can only see them by running through all the groups. So, but 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 this this concept of how band connectivity in the Brillouin zone was introduced by by Zach for single groups. Um, in order to extend it to all the double groups uh, with time reversal, you need you need. Um, um, this connection to graph theory to like kind of make it to make it uh, uh, automatic basically just a diagon matrix diagonalization and it's kind of a big task because you have 230 space groups as I said with or without time reversal single or double groups and each space group has a lot of you know k points in the Brillouin zone high symmetry k points in the Brillouin zone and high symmetry lines in the Brillouin zone so you have to you know, make sure you haven't missed any connections. You have to take the minimal set of paths so that you make sure that you haven't missed any connection. For example, here, if somehow I messed up and didn't take, you know, if there was another point in the Brian zone where these become, became connected, then I would, give, I would get the wrong answer. So you have to make all these things sure. Uh, and this, you know, will, took us about a year to actually straighten out. But now we have all the connectivities of all the space groups, of all the orbitals at um, 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 all the points in all the points that matter in the lattice. Okay. Okay. So, for example, this is a more complicated graph, and let me show you that it actually um, can find symmetry enforced val points. So, for example, this is uh, I think this is I'm not sure what group this is. Probably 205, something like this. I don't I don't remember. But the point is, you can kind of see that this is a disconnected part. Actually, this turns out to be topological also for reasons I'll tell you about. But then you can see here that between gamma and x, there is a val point. And there's a val point, might be also a, um, a, a, a nodal line, but we can, we can classify it. Because the representation that moves here is different from the representation that moves here, so no gap can open. Now you can ask, well, you don't know energy, so I can move this up here, for example. But yes, you can, but this is representation epsilon 1, and this is representation epsilon 2. So you'll always have, if you move it above this, say here, you'll always have a val point here. So there's some fundamental topological things that you can get even about semi-metals from this type of graph, just looking at these, these, graph, um, 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 these graphs. OK, so <coughs> again, what we've done is we have our input, all the, rep uh, all the irreducible representations of high symmetry points. We've mapped high symmetry points into graph nodes. Um, we compute the distinct graph connectivities by this, this just the, now it becomes just a graph theory problem. And we map grand connect, uh, graph connectivity to actual band connectivity in, 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 in uh, electronic structure. And the output is the list, list of distinct band connectivities for all the space groups. OK, so now that actually gives you all the bands you can have in nature for at least the non-magnetic groups. And so now 
those bands can be topological or trivial. How do we know which ones are topological? Well, the, no, the way we know which ones are topological is by enumerating the ones that are trivial. So again, two insulators are not created equal, same bulk band structure, different edges, and, and really the way we kind of see in momentum space, the way we have to see in momentum space that an insulator is topological is by doing Wilson loops or by computing Berry phases. Okay, so by computing Berry phases, you can kind of see in momentum space that, that if your Berry phase does something um, weird, such as winds around the Brian zone for one Vanya center or for the other, winds once in from zero to pi, or winds twice from zero to pi, or winds nothing, these are trivial and this is non-trivial. So basically, Berry phases are a fundamental um, 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 thing that you would have to compute in the Brian zone to get to, you know, to find out the topological nature of, of, of systems. Now, we kind of want to get rid of that because we want to, you know, we want to link momentum space to real space. So, <coughs> the way to get rid of that is to realize that, that, that um, having non-trivial Berry phases or non-trivial things that do um, this means that you actually cannot have maximally localized Vanier orbitals. Now, this is something that Solyanov and Vanderbilt pointed out in 2011, and you can really understand it through these Berry phases, but the moral of the story is that I'm going to give you a much simpler explanation why topological insulators cannot be uh, described by maximally localized Vanier functions that respect the symmetries that you impose on the system. So, for example, a Vanier, maximally localized Vanier state is exponential, falls off exponentially, and if I put an insulator that's topological next to an insulator that's trivial, the insulator that's trivial, I can clearly describe it by maximally localized Vanier states because I can just describe it by, you know, a wave function that's got amplitude one on the insulating, uh, on the occupied orbital. But if I can describe the topological insulator by maximally localized Vanier states, then I have a fundamental problem. And my fundamental problem is that, you know, I can make this area between them, between the topological insulator and the trivial insulator, large, and then there will be no weight on the interface, no wave function weight on the interface between the topological insulator and the trivial insulator. That means if these wave functions are exponentially localized um, 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 in the bulk. So that means that if there's no weight, then I have no edge state, gapless edge states, because gapless edge states are not exponentially localized. So basically, that means that if I was able to describe my insulator, my topological insulators by maximally localized Vanier states, I would have no edge states. Obviously, we know topological insulators have edge states, are described by edge states, so um, this statement must be true. <coughs> okay, so this is exactly what I said. The topological insulator, the way we're defining it now, is defined by an uh, inexistent Vanier state description. So now w we've kind of moved the, kicked the ball a little bit further. All we have to do to get the trivial bands is get the bands in um, electronic structure that are describable by a maximally localized Vanier description. And that's actually another group theory problem that we can solve. So those bands are actually called elementary band representations and will come out um, 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 in the next slides. But once we have those, then we have all the band structures. We can take the quotient of band structure occupies, uh, obtained from um, uh, maximally, uh, uh, from symmetric maximally localized Vanier orbit, Vanier functions, and we can have what's, um, what's uh, non-trivial. Okay, so <coughs> in order to get basically um, um, the wave function, the, 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 to get a classification of all the things that are trivial, um, we go to this theory of, again, Zach, and then Michelle Zach and Bakri for um, uh, single groups. And this is a theory of elementary band representations. And what basically Zach said is that if I want to look at a crystal, there are some building blocks of band structures. And the building blocks of band structures are these elementary band representations. And, and um, what they set out to prove, actually, is that these elementary band representations are all connected. So in the Brian zone, you can think of bands as a representation. And what Zach, Michel Zach uh, and Bakri and a lot of people set out to prove is that they're all connected in the Brian zone. Now, of course, by setting out to prove this, they missed topological insulators, but you know, they were very close. And also, they, 
there's the statement that even for single groups, which is the only thing that they looked at, um, 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 the, the bands are connected, are fully connected in the Brion zone, which is not true. There's some non-symorphic groups for that which are not connected. But you know, modulo these 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 these, these, these small mistakes, which which uh, are you know the cause of it was that these groups are really complicated. This is a fundamentally kind of you know forward-looking work that was that was you know um, that 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 didn't get the attention that 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 was needed. Uh, and of course, there's another you know 2011 paper by Solyanov and Vanderbilt where where they talk about maximally localized Vanya states um, and they show that topological insulators cannot be described by maximally localized uh, Vanya states that respect the symmetries of the lattice. So now how do we find these elementary band representations, which are the building blocks of, 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 of band structures, which are actually, if they are connected in the Brion zone, they're described by maximally localized uh, Vanya orbitals. Well, the way to, define, to find them is actually not that hard. What you say is you have a lattice and on this lattice, you have what's called maximal wick oppositions. And the maximal wick oppositions are just positions on the lattice whose symmetry group is a maximal subgroup of the total space group. So for example, this here, if I, have, if I look at the graphing lattice, there's three wick oppositions. That are, there's this position, which is multiplicity one. There's this position, which is multiplicity three, because I can apply the symmetry operations of the group and move this from here to here, so I have three of them, okay, and the uh, and there's this position where actually the atoms sit, which is multiplicity two, which means that by applying the symmetry operators, I can move this here to here. Now each of these Wyckoff positions have their has their own what's called stabilizer group, which means the group that just leaves the position invariant. It's a subgroup of the point group, and you'll see that if you just go through it, you know, each of these positions will have a Stabilizer group that's maximal within the um, um, within within the space group. So basically, there's no other group that contains the stabilizer group of this. That's also a subgroup of the space group. So that's the so so that's the meaning of maximal <laughs> subgroup. Now the point is that maximal subgroups are and maximal wick oppositions hold an important role in between all the wick oppositions of the lattice. Because um, um, they, they give you this elementary band representation, so they give you the building blocks of the band structures, and I'll tell you how they give, it, how they give them to you in the next, next slide. So here's an example of um, um, the symmetry group of the weak opposition 2B uh, is C3V, symmetry group generated by these operators, you'll see that you'll have to retranslate. It's a point group, really. It looks like it's got translations, but it's really a point group. It's isomorphic to a point group. And the point is that once I put my graphene atoms here, I can transform the orbitals, when I put them here, into representations of this stabilizer group. So now I have a real space description. This is, notice how it's changed from momentum space to real space. This is the real space lattice. I put my orbitals here, and I ask, well, what representations do they have? And you know, because of crystal field and other things, all that that means is that uh, um, the um, 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 orbitals here transform into representations of this side symmetry, of this uh, side symmetry group, uh, which is a stabilizer group of this, of this site, if my orbitals sit here. OK. So now, how do I get bands? How do I get these elementary band representations? Well, it's a very, you know, it's, it sounds hard, but it's something that in mathematics was, was done hundreds of years ago. It's just representation induction. So what you say is that, well, I have the stabilizer group, the group that leaves this position invariant, and then I have the full lattice. Okay, the full lattice has a bigger space group. You know, I've, it's, it's got other rotations than just the stabilizer group, etc. Uh, <coughs> and it's got translations, and the translations of this lattice are actually momentum space, right? Once I Fourier transform, they're around the momentum space. So the representation on the stabilizer group are finite because the stabilizer group is a point group. The, the representation of the stabilizer group are just S and P orbitals, so there's a finite irreducible representation. But when I go to the momentum space, representation be the representation becomes infinite, but that's just the momentum in the Brillouin zone. Okay? So all I need to do to find, to find the, um, 
representation in momentum space is induce a representation from the site symmetry group into the full space group. Now representation induction is something that's known in mathematics how to do. You, people have known how to do it for hundreds of years. So all you're doing is you're inducing a representation from a finite point group, which is the symmetry group, the site symmetry group, to the full space group. Now this is an infinite representation, but that infinity just tells you that you have a lot of momentas in the Brian zone. So that infinity is a bit fake. So then what you can do is you can go on every high symmetry line from this full representation induced in the full space group. You can go in momentum space on every symmetry line, on every symmetry point, and ask what are the representations at those high symmetry points and those high symmetry lines. Okay? So basically that's how you find, how you find um, um, el the elementary band representation. And why are they described by maximally localized Vani orbitals, well, I started with a site orbital. I said I have an orbital which is, which is you know, SP, whatever it is, and it's localized here, and I'm inducing representation to the full band, and from here I'm finding out what happens in the K space by subducing or restricting representations from this full K space to just some high symmetry points that I'm interested in. Okay. So <coughs> the dimension of this representation the dimension of this, sorry, the dimension of this representation, after you mod out the momentum, this infinite fake kind of translational symmetry momentum, is actually the band connectivity if the bands have a Vanier uh, description. So the dimension of this representation, which is usually, but not always, the dimension of the representation, you know, of this symmetry group, of the stabilized group, times the dimension of the Wick oppositions, gives you the band connectivity. So for example, let's try this simple example. If I had PZ orbitals in graphene without spin orbit coupling, I have one PZ orbital on this side is dimension one, but I have two sides here, one and two, Wick opposition. So, so uh, my band will be twofold connected in the Brion zone, and we know that's true because I have, can I write here? No. We know that's true because without spin orbit coupling, you know, I have, I have these Dirac points, so they're, well, whatever. So it's twofold connected, I have two bands. So that's just the simple, it's not always the simple, there's exceptions to the rule, um, um, which are very complicated that you have to work out, but, but roughly that's, that's, you know, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a mechanical thing that you can do. Okay, so what we have done is we've gone through all the 230 space groups, through all the wick oppositions, through all the orbitals, and we've classified all the possible um, uh, elementary band representations. So that tells you that if I have a orbital sitting on some site of some weak opposition of all these 230 space, of any of these 230 space groups, um, <coughs> the bands, if they have a Vanya description, again, if they have a maximally localized Vanya description that respects all the symmetries of the crystal, um, will be part of this classification, which have, which basically, it comes out to kind of a nice number, I don't know why, 10,400 different band, different elementary band representations. Okay, so now the main result is that any isolated set of bands that is not part of this 10,400 um, elementary band representations, or some of them, um, um, or you know, any linear combination of them, gives you a topological insulator. So I want to kind of like, uh, there's been other, other classifications, uh, especially uh, uh, these, these two works. And I want to basically point out something missing in these classifications. So what's missing in this classification, so these classifications basically, there's, there's even a complete classification claim. Um, <coughs> what, what, is, what is missing in these classifications is the fact that they identify bands by asking questions only in momentum space. So for example, if I took out inversion symmetry, if I took out inversion symmetry, this classification in the second classification in graphene would tell me that the bands that come out of with spin orbit coupling of two out of two B orbitals can actually be obtained by making by adding up bands from the wick opposition that come from this wick opposition 1A. That's not what they say, but really it's if you look at the K space content of this, this is what, what actually comes out. Now, the point is that is true, and, and it, it is true, bands that come from here can be identified by